olhar para as estrelas sempre nos fez pensar. Quem somos nós? Por que estamos aqui? Estamos sozinhos? No mundo antigo e no atual também, nós buscamos as respostas na religião e na ciência. Mas será que uma pode ajudar a outra? Será que padres podem ser cientistas? Filhos de Galileu Trinta quilômetros ao sul da cidade do Vaticano, na vila de Castel Gandolfo, o Papa tem uma residência de veraneio. Ele passa dois meses por ano no local a fim de fugir do calor em Roma. Mas uma ala do palácio é dedicada a um propósito especial. Trata-se da área onde fica o Observatório do Vaticano. O relacionamento da igreja com a astronomia é tão antigo quanto o cristianismo. Três homens acompanharam um sinal no céu para descobrir onde Jesus Cristo nasceria. O observatório atual foi criado em 1891 como um símbolo, cujo objetivo era mostrar que a igreja não era inimiga da ciência. Mas nem todos da igreja aceitam bem as descobertas da ciência moderna. O padre George Coyne é diretor do observatório. Ele é padre há mais de 50 anos e tem doutorado em astrofísica. Eu acredito que o trabalho da comunidade é muito regardado pelo Vaticano. Eles percebem que nós somos reconhecidos no cenário internacional, mas mesmo que eles o respeitem, o que você não pode esperar que eles o apreciem em muitas maneiras é a influência cultural que nosso trabalho tem. For the good of the church. Quando o padre George foi apontado diretor, iniciou um curso para alunos formados em astronomia e astrofísica. Apesar do financiamento do Vaticano, a fé dos praticantes está fora de questão. It's a school in observational astronomy and astrophysics. Students are here in the papal palace. Our staff are all Jesuit priests. And I as director have desperately worked hard to keep the schools strictly science. You get high quality faculty, you select very good students and instruct them in astrophysics. If the schools were going to be schools in science and religion, I wouldn't run the schools, I'd stop them. It's a whole other reality. We can make no contribution, valuable contribution, to things like the science-religion dialogue unless we're doing good science. So you can enjoy here, you can enjoy the palace, the Pope is not here yet. So you don't have to kneel down at any stage, <laughs> but be back at the palace front door, I would say, to assemble at 10.15. Have a nice time. Thank you. Para alguns visitantes, a ideia de fazer ciência no Vaticano é desafiadora. I'm not Catholic. My father is from a Jew family and my mother is from a Catholic family. I don't have any religion. I have been raised without believing in God, so I don't feel it. <laughs> and for me, it's a big wonder how is it that a person can believe in God so 
strongly as a Jesuit can do, and at the same time studying cosmology or trying to model a world that is supposed to have been modeled by God. And I see there a, a big paradox, and I don't understand how they live every day with this paradox. Once an astronomer came to our school and said, maybe at the end of the trip we will arrive to the same answer that the church has already arrived in a shorter way. We will arrive to the conclusion that yes, this has been created by someone, someone, some thing, and organize and settle, or maybe we will arrive to another one. But that astronomer is wondering from the beginning, his first point of depart is saying, I don't know. But the point of depart of the Jesuit is saying, I know. So what is he looking for, if he already knows? We say the Jesuits embraced education. Really, the Jesuits embraced the intellectual life and promulgated that through education. It's not the same thing. You can be a teacher and do nothing but teach by rote the facts that have already been there. But that wasn't what the Jesuits taught. The study of the physical world is, for us, a way of getting closer to God. O irmão Guy Consul Magno fez pós-doutorado em Harvard e no MIT. When I knew I was coming to the Vatican Observatory, I realized there were two things I was going to have to learn. One was quantum physics, because people would always ask me about Eastern mysticism and quantum physics, and I'd better know something about both. And the other was Galileo, because I knew people were going to ask me about Galileo. Galileu Galilei nasceu em 1564, em uma época que as pessoas estavam certas de que entendiam o mecanismo do universo. A ordem das coisas era previsível e a Terra seria o centro de tudo. O estudo medieval da natureza confirmava a crença religiosa de que o homem era o foco da criação divina. Quando Nicolau Copérnico propôs que a Terra girava em torno do Sol, ele desafiou o senso comum, porque ninguém sentia a Terra se movendo. Mas Galileu tinha dúvidas. Ele amava a matemática e aplicou a ciência ao movimento dos objetos celestes. Quando soube de um instrumento que fazia corpos distantes parecerem mais próximos, decidiu construir um, com lentes e um tubo, e então levou-o ao olho e apontou-o para o céu. Galileo has the insight that the Copernican system is a more elegant system. He has the insight that the telescope is a tool that can help you understand the planets and their motions. Now, the telescope was an amazing thing because for the first time a scientist was being asked to depend on some instrument they didn't necessarily understand to give them their data. So when you look at Jupiter and you see little dots moving on either side, are those really moons going around Jupiter or are those internal reflections in the telescope? If you've never used a telescope before, how are you going to know? Galileu olhou através do telescópio e descobriu estrelas escondidas pela escuridão. Ele se concentrou em Júpiter e identificou quatro pequenas luas girando em torno do planeta. Teve certeza então de que a Terra não era o centro de tudo. Galileu, um, right from the beginning, saw the dangers to the church of the new cosmology, uh, as it were, being prescribed being forbidden by the church because he saw the, the damage that that would do to the church and where he was concerned this new cosmology could be a major sort of Christian understanding. I mean he could see no reason why the, the Bible and, and the new cosmology, the sun-centered cosmology, why they could not live together. Mas as visões de Galileu conflitavam com a leitura literal da Bíblia. 
A igreja declarou a teoria de Copérnico absurda como a filosofia e contrária às escrituras e instruiu Galileu a abandoná-la. Galileu escreveu um livro no qual três personagens debatiam o velho e o novo sistema ao longo de diversos dias. No final, disse que apenas Deus poderia conhecer a verdadeira constituição do universo, mas defender as ideias de Copérnico com tanta força que ninguém se deixou enganar. O Papa explodiu de raiva e disse que Galileu entrara onde não deveria ter entrado, no mais sério e perigoso dos temas. Galileu foi convocado pela Inquisição. Galileu não foi queimado, foi silenciado. Temendo as consequências de ser considerado um herege, ele negou uma teoria que acreditava piamente ser verdadeira. Foi condenado por suspeita de heresia e passou o restante da vida aqui, sob prisão domiciliar. Pouco tempo após a sentença, ele ficou cego. Os jesuítas eram a ordem intelectual da Igreja Católica. Alguns eram matemáticos e astrônomos que confirmaram as observações de Galileu. Mas como ordem, eles obedeciam os ensinamentos da Igreja. Enquanto Galileu era julgado e punido, os jesuítas construíam uma igreja em homenagem ao fundador de sua ordem, Santo Inácio de Loyola, que lhes ensinou, acima de tudo, a procurar por Deus em todas as coisas inclusive nas descobertas da ciência. O arquiteto jesuíta Grassi projetou-a para ser a mais alta igreja de Roma. He designed it to have a dome, a big dome. And when they built it, they built four huge pillars to support the weight of the dome. But they ran out of money. And the first time you step into the church, you look up and you say, wait a minute, there's a dome, it looks perfectly good. It's actually painted on a flat roof in perspective. When you go underneath it, you can see it looks really strange. It's not a real dome. Several hundred years later, in the 1860s, another Jesuit, Angelo Sacchi, went to the roof of this church where the pillars had been built to support a weight that was never put on them. And instead, he built an astronomical observatory, telescopes on each pillar, And from here, he was able to, for the first time, measure the spectra of stars, run starlight through a prism, measure the chemical composition and the temperature of a star. And at that moment, stars no longer were just points of light in the sky. They became places with a chemistry and with a physics. Astronomy stopped being positional astronomy e suddenly had become astrophysics. O que Sack descobriu na década de 1860 foi que a luz das estrelas carregava informações. Os astrônomos já podiam saber a idade de uma estrela e os elementos dos quais ela era feita. Possuíam a informação de que precisavam para começar a entender a evolução do universo. On this church, designed by Grassi, during the time of Galileo, Angelo Secchi became the father of astrophysics. Não seria a última vez que os jesuítas construiriam um telescópio em um local improvável. O 
o padre George de o Vaticano a construir seu novo telescópio no Arizona. George trabalha na Universidade do Arizona há quase 40 anos. Você circula eles e dê-los de volta para mim, e eu vou olhar para eles. Qual você acha que eu deveria olhar? Ele ainda passa cinco meses do ano aqui como professor de astronomia. Ok, eu gostaria de começar, por favor. Isso é observacional. Se há algo que é observacional, cosmology is that is we have to see objects at huge distances and try and interpret the origins and the evolution of the universe from what we see how did the universe begin and how is it itself aging there are strongly religious people not the jesuit astronomer priests but others within the catholic church for whom having science within their house is a difficult proposition, especially when that science is one that talks about issues like our place in the universe and an origin with quantum events that took place 13 billion years ago. That's, that's difficult stuff because, you know, the theologians of the church, of the Catholic church are, are uh, you know, they're liberal minded enough to almost always talk about biblical documents and religious records as being stories or metaphorical. They're not fundamentalist in that sense that a lot of American sects are fundamentalist. But it's very easy in discussions of cosmology to get to a, a juncture where, you know, people start getting uncomfortable. O laboratório da universidade está construindo espelhos grandes o bastante para que possamos olhar quase até o início dos tempos. This is not every day you see this. The two eight meter mirrors going. The one is polished and the other one is being polished. They'll be used in the uh, large binocular telescope on Mount Graham, the world's next largest telescope. And to think that the Vatican telescope was the first one made with this technique of mirrors in a rotating furnace. I know my experience as a young Jesuit when they decided that I should go and do a doctorate in mathematics. They decided first. That changed later on. A fellow Jesuit and myself were going to study together, so we looked around for the best schools in the fields that we were interested in. We came up with such schools as the University of Pennsylvania, um, Dartmouth, one other Brown. And, you know, the superiors of those days thought, you know, these young Jesuits, if we send them to one of these state universities, they'll lose their faith, especially studying the sciences. I mean, there was that kind of attitude towards it. Well, that's an absurd attitude, certainly today. My own experience has been that science, if correctly understood, can really nourish one's faith. This is a dying star. At the end of its life, has no more thermonuclear fuel and throws off its outer envelope. If it did not happen, you and I would not be here. And that's not poetry, that's not scripture, that's not theology or philosophy, that's science. You and I simply would not be here if there had not been three generations of stars being born and dying. So we are all made of stardust. I have a colleague at the University of Arizona who says we're all made of thermonuclear waste. And while it's the same thing, I prefer to call it stardust. Okay. <laughs> Poderemos compreender que o universo evoluiu através da morte e do nascimento de estrelas, de modo a produzir os elementos necessários para formar um cérebro humano capaz de contemplar o próprio universo. Reality cannot always be imagined 
or experienced. See, our experience as material, spiritual human beings is always within a space-time framework. So it's very difficult for us to imagine anything existing that does not exist at a certain place at a certain time. We can't imagine it, but mathematicians can compute it. Isto é um buraco negro. Nossas mentes previram sua existência utilizando a física e a matemática muito antes de eles terem sido detectados. Mas como é que podemos compreender isto? O padre Andy Whitman está aposentado e vem trabalhando no mesmo problema matemático há três anos. Something that's crept into these numbers that should not be. It's got to be in three places. And yet, I haven't been able to find in those three places any error. So there may be a conceptual error even back. Something's wrong somewhere. But that's the way it goes in mathematics. It's 136 pages. I mean, what can you expect? Este programa chega a você por cortesia de Santa Rita. Experiência memorável. Somente por The History Channel. Put up with any more of these journalists. I know. Well, throw them out. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Quando o Padre George chegou ao Observatório do Vaticano, já não restavam bons locais de observação na Itália. Então, ele trouxe os astrônomos jesuítas a um dos principais centros de astronomia do mundo. Our community or a group of religious priests who have a common spiritual heritage from Saint Ignatius of Loyola. So we share a lot in our spiritual formation, and now we share a lot in our profession. We're all scientists, so we're in various fields. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for this day. I mean, we're the only group of research scientists sponsored by the Catholic Church. So we're an unusual group in that sense. Amen. We take our principal meal together, we celebrate the liturgy, we live what is called a community life. And yet our profession requires that we do a lot of travel, that we cannot spend a lot of time praying together. We're active, but we should be reflectively active. We should realize our action itself is a prayer. I'll go in there. One, two, three, four, five. We're heading on up to Mount Graham which is at about 3,000 meters, uh, 10,500 feet. Got to do it both ways because we've got Europeans in the group. And it can get very cold there. They say every 3,000 feet up is like going 1,000 miles north. A very dark, very dry, very remote spot. It's going to be something like uh, Canada this time of year by the time I get up there. Para chegar ao moderno telescópio do Vaticano, é preciso fazer uma viagem de quatro horas partindo da cidade de Tucson. I'm a meteoriticist. I actually am interested in planets, how they were formed, where they come from, what they're made out of. In particular, the small guys, uh, whether the moons of the Jupiter, or the moons of the small planets, or the Kuiper Belt objects, or the asteroids, or the meteorites, because, I mean, the, the, the holy grail is to figure out how did the solar system form. And if we're going to understand that, you have to start with the small guys, because it should be the easiest to understand. If we can't understand the small guys, I have no idea how you can have any faith that we understand the big guys. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. Oh, 
I'm changing focus. We're moving. We're there. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. Second beat. Yeah. This is an object that has been reported changes its color as it spins. The guy who did that and reported it's a very exciting observation if it's true. But he had a small telescope, he had a poorer CCD. We've got a bigger telescope, we've got a newer and fresher CCD. We can see deeper into the blue color than he can. We'll give it a shot. We'll see if we see it. O Vaticano tem uma grande coleção de meteoritos e Guy se tornou o curador do tesouro. Astronomers claim that they study stars and they study galaxies, but really all they do is study light. All you can actually do is study the light from a star or the light from a galaxy. Except I have in my hands, in my laboratory, the actual stuff that comes from stars and galaxies and planets. These essentially are the primitive meteorites and these are the processed meteorites. Scientifically, meteorites are interesting because they're actually pieces of space that come from someplace other than Earth. They're reminders that the beautiful blue sky you see is not an impenetrable shield, that things actually do come from out there and touch us, and we can go out through it and touch them. What we have here are actual pieces of stardust. This is the oldest thing you have ever seen. Because this rock is older than planet Earth. And the white inclusions here are the oldest bits of the solar system. Cada uma destas galáxias contém cerca de 400 bilhões de estrelas e existem cerca de 400 bilhões de galáxias no universo. 3000 years ago when we had no idea of what the universe was like, our picture of God was a whole lot smaller. Our picture of God has to be different by understanding the bigger context that God must be existing in. Face it, most of us stop learning about religion or science when we're about 10 years old. And we're stuck with a 10-year-old's understanding of both. And there's only so much that a 10-year-old could understand. Of course it's going to look silly when you're 30. But it's your own fault for not realizing there's more to it than what you learned when you were 10. Did it happen by chance or did it happen by necessity? I'm talking about, did life come about by chance or necessity? I'm really sticking my neck out now, but I think this is the point I want to make. The universe is so big, with so many stars, so many suns, so many planets, so much chemistry going on, that life, to a certain extent, had to come to be. And yet chance is a part of it. Now, what does this say to my religious faith? And what I think it says to faith on this issue, my faith on this issue, is that I should begin to think about God more as a parent, as a generator. And a wise parent knows how to let go. You teach, you give standards to, but there comes a certain time when you have to let loose. So let's ask the hard question, and I will give a heretical answer that I'm quite willing to reform, okay? If I knew all the physics three billion years after the Big Bang, could I predict that life would come to be? And my answer is no. And if I could not, I cannot think of God as having predetermined and necessarily knowing that life would come to be. Heresia dizer que Deus não sabia que a vida surgiria? E dizer que Deus não controlou a criação? Será que o Deus do Gênesis deixaria as coisas simplesmente acontecerem? See, the classical view, and certainly in Catholic doctrine, 
is that when the human being comes to be, every human being, God directly creates a human soul. Right? And I don't think that's totally adequate to the reality. Okay, I'm not denying the doctrine. Okay, I'm trying to cover my tracks. But there's more to it than that. And the current Pope thinks there's more to it than that. But he can't give an answer either because we haven't, we haven't matured to the point where we can give an answer. The idea of God is evaluating as we are evaluating in understanding our nature. And we are adapting this idea to what we learn step by step. But then that would mean that God didn't create us, but we create the God we need, or the God we can create with the knowledge we have. O cargueiro Nazihain dorme sob as águas da Flórida. Teríamos Estados Unidos o afundle. Galileu morreu durante a prisão domiciliar em sua casa perto de Florença, nove anos após o julgamento. Durante 300 anos, nenhum Papa mencionou seu nome em público. There's always this dominant um, kind of psychology of save the good name of the church. Um, so, I mean, you don't tell falsehoods. You don't twist history into saying what history doesn't say. But you prejudice history so that the church does not look bad. In my attitude, if the church has made a mistake, it's not the only church, the only person that ever made a mistake. To make a mistake is human. And it's more than human to admit you made a mistake and move on from there. And the church did not. It cut off a budding scientist in his career. And any time they do that, they're wrong. There's three things you have to remember about Galileo. He was a devout Catholic to the end of his days. Fundamentally, he was right. And the third thing to remember is that the church was wrong. Not for one argument or another argument or coming to the wrong decision in the trial, but in the fact that they went after Galileo with the power of religion over an issue that fundamentally was not religious. I'm not afraid. No, I know you're not. Yeah. Why not? Well, because I think the truth should be put out there, and then you contest it. You know, if I'm wrong, please tell me so, and show me where I'm wrong in my judgment to the Galileo case. And, you know, I'd be happy to accept that if I'm wrong. Look at this. It's a coleopter. We call it cervo. Cervo, like a deer. But flying deer, cervo volante. When I was a boy, I made the collection of this type of insects, which are called coleopter. They are very beautiful. Some of them very big and uh, colorful. This is one very common here in this region. Now, I give him the freedom. <laughs> Look at the moon, it's bright and that. Very beautiful. <laughs> and the dough is rotating. O padre Sabino Mafeu é físico e é jesuíta desde os 15 anos. A religião nunca pôde controlar o espírito das descobertas científicas. 
mas a ciência pode informar a religião, respondendo algumas perguntas e fazendo surgir outras. Ela aprofunda os mistérios e é capaz de se aventurar por todas as coisas. O Papa chegou a Castel Gandolfo. Quando ele está na propriedade, abençoa o público todas as quartas-feiras no pátio central do palácio. Arizona. On all aspects of astronomy, he's very active and directly connected to the science and the research that the Jesuits do. So they have an extremely strong advocate. Um, but not all of the people who will elect the next pope um, feel that way. I came here as director in 1978. Wow. I was appointed by John Paul the first, mm -hmm. who only lived for one month. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Never met him, but I was appointed by him. A fim de expandir o trabalho do observatório para além da medida do orçamento do Vaticano, George criou uma fundação. Doações ajudam a financiar o telescópio no Arizona e a bancar bolsas de estudo para astrônomos em países em desenvolvimento. Neste verão, ele está recebendo a visita de americanos interessados em apoiar o trabalho. Where you see these ruins, they go all the way down for two football fields in length. That is the Emperor Domitian's villa. It's the first floor. It went up two more floors and looked out to sea. As you walk down there to your right... Going the into the future requires planning. And it's not just me, it's the group as a whole who we have to attract younger Jesuits to work with us. And uh, we have to train them. We have to plan for the future. A telescope that was new is not always new. So enjoy walking around here. Do wear your badges because at this time of year with the Pope coming, they tend to shoot first and ask later. So they don't see your badge. We both forgot our badge. You better hang on to your husband here. Okay. Scientists are asking ultimate questions. We're asking How did the universe begin? Why is there something rather than nothing? Now how more ultimate can you get? At some point, possibly within our lifetimes, we may have to face what it means to not be the kingpins of the universe, as far as life goes. It's quite a plausible prospect. Most cosmologists speculating about the vastness of time and space and the likely number of biological experiments that have played out on planets around other stars in this or other galaxies would say that it's statistically highly probable not only that we're not alone in the universe, that we're in a time scale sense inferior to the most advanced creatures because chemical life similar to our own carbon-based life could have had its start five, six, seven billion years ago. So just imagine a little Earth-like experiment taking place that got to the point we are and then went on another billion years or two, what would you get?
is very probably to expand forever. So galaxies will continue to sail apart, not because of any propulsion, but because space itself is expanding and carrying them apart. And then within galaxies, all the lights will gradually turn out, like someone turning a big dimmer switch over billions of years. And eventually the life cycle of star birth and death will be broken because all the gas or the hydrogen will have been used up. You'll just be left with a sort of a set of embers of stars held together still by gravity moving apart through space. So it's probably a dead universe in the end. It's not a great prospect, but of course it's a distant prospect, so. Em cerca de 4 bilhões de anos, nosso sol mudará radicalmente, tornando-se um gigante vermelho e consumindo nossa Terra. Então, se apagará e morrerá. O universo universo está destinado a uma morte, uma morte. É o que nós cientificamente sobre o universo. Mas esse é o meu ponto. No processo disso acontecer, pelo menos em nós, parece que algo mais aconteceu. Isso é o espírito que se levantou. E a minha acredito é... As, as a human being now, as a believing Christian, that we transcend this process. We transcend this physical process, this chemical process, this biological process. We transcend it. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not poo-pooing what's going to happen to the material universe. It's been the cradle for the spirit emerging. Death, our short life, why to do things if it's so short? Why to behave if it's so short? It has to be a, an award at the end that would be eternity, for instance, through our soul, through many lives in Buddhism. So I don't think it's easy to live thinking it's 70, 80, 90 years, and that's it. It's not easy for me to live with it, but I kind of accept it. Maybe it would be good if I could believe. My education put me in front of this reality and that's it. And I cannot switch now. Será que a ciência e a religião podem se reconciliar? São ambas, a fé e a razão, respostas para a beleza e o mistério que nos cercam? Será que elas, enfim, encontrarão um equilíbrio? This is our faith, and we rejoice in being able to profess it in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Sophia, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Are you saying that God came to be when the universe came to be? No, I am not. God is, has always been and always will be. How do you know that? Faith. Faith. It's not irrational. It doesn't go against anything I know that God always was. You can't come to that reality simply by pure human reasoning. You can come to a philosophical God. The really radical idea of Christianity is that this universe, this physical universe, 
these bodies that we have are so important that God himself incarnated himself into this universe. Not only does this mean that human beings and our lives are important, we're not just sitting around here waiting to die so we can get on with what, was, what really matters, but it also means that this physical universe is worth spending your life getting to know. Take a look. And I hope that people who say, I don't understand how you reconcile being a Jesuit and being a scientist, will have that same attitude, saying, oh, but he does do it. There must be more to this than I thought. And that's at least a place to start. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. It's so cool.